Well, good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church here in Westlake Village. My name is Pastor Dave Rohde and I'm standing here in our sanctuary and it is so good to have you join us for this digital worship service. As we come together, some from our homes, some from uh, out on vacation, wherever you might be, I invite you to be called to worship by these words out of Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Friends, let's join together in worship. Belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your 
Hi, everybody. Good to see you again. Our reading for today is from Luke 10, 1 through 16. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we turn to prayer this morning, in addition to lifting up the needs of our community and of our world, I want to invite us to, to turn our attention to the schools in our neighborhoods. Uh, th those schools that are about to begin, including our, our own preschool here at Westminster, as well as those schools that have already started. To just take some time to pray for staff, for families, uh, for teachers, for the kids, for everyone. Let's pray. Gracious God, we're so grateful for the life that you give and for the opportunity to journey together, to learn from one another, and to see you move in our midst. We're in a season of transition, both here at WPC as well as around the world. Help us to lean into you, to trust you, with all of our questions, our uncertainty, with our doubt. As we search for answers, help us to be faithful in the day-to-day -day task of loving you and loving one another. God, it's so easy to be consumed by the brokenness and anxiety that surrounds us, from illness to loneliness and isolation to acting out of self-preservation and fear of the other. Forgive us, heal us, redeem us, help us to turn to you. We pray for schools that are launching into a new year, from our preschool here at WPC to colleges and universities. We lift up children and students and parents who are on edge about how the year might look, as well as the administrators and teaching staff who are creating, uh, are working to create um, environments conducive for learning in a, a difficult season. Lord, we know that you hold us in your hands, that you're working in ways that we can't always see, that we can't always explain or grasp. Help us to remain steadfast and to live our lives in a way that brings you honor and glory. We lift up all these things as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This weekend, we are continuing in our mini-series on what it means to be sent by Jesus out into the world. Now, for the majority of the summer, we spent time talking about Jesus' invitation to follow him. And then last week, I suggested that when we pair that invitation, the invitation to follow Jesus, with the charge or, or the encouragement to be sent out into the world, when we pair those two things together, we really get the crux of what it means to be a disciple. We follow Jesus and we're sent out into the world by him. Now, this series, it, it finds its, its roots in John 20, 21, where the resurrected Christ shows up to his first followers and says, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Sent out to our neighborhoods, the places we work, go to school, shop for our groceries. Last week, we, we looked at Matthew 10, where Jesus gives the 12 disciples instructions about the where, what, and how of their ministry. They were to start at home with the lost sheep of Israel, with what was familiar to them. They were to continue Jesus' work of, of bringing healing and restoration in that place. And they were to get involved with the work by giving freely of themselves, really creating cultures of generosity. And we are invited to do the same thing today. So what Julianne read earlier, it, it should sound somewhat familiar to what we read last week. And in Luke's gospel, chapter nine tells the story of the 12 being sent out. So in all likelihood, the 72 that we're talking about here are in addition to the 12 disciples. It's a great reminder that we are all called into ministry in some capacity. We are all sent with different skill sets and, and different gifts. We are all sent. Jesus sends them out two by two, which was a common practice for a few different reasons. One, it gave everyone a partner or a friend for the journey. Two, it provided a sense of protection. No one traveled alone. And third, it followed Hebrew law, a Hebrew law which required more than one witness to convict any person. So Jesus uses the, the same harvest language with the 72 that he did with the, the 12. The work was, was plentiful. And again, the ever comforting language of being like lambs among wolves, a reminder of how painful the journey can be. They're to take very little with them, to travel lightly, to go from house to house, passing the peace of Christ, looking for people who were doing the same sort of work, people in the neighborhoods who were, were trying to bring wholeness and restoration and to partner with them. Then there's the woes, or really the warnings. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, all towns or villages along the Sea of Galilee, all places where Jesus spent a whole lot of time. These, these warnings, they use language that mimic prophetic texts. And likely the 72 who were sent out, they would have been familiar with that text. If you're rejected, don't worry. They're really rejecting me, Jesus says, and it will be worse for them than it was for the pagan cities of old. So they go. They're sent out. And we're not sure exactly what happens in the day-to-day -day of their journey, but starting in verse 17, we read this. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he returned to his disciples and, and said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. And, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
We've reached that time of year where all kinds of pictures are popping up on, on social media or really being sent between family members and friends about the start of, yes, another new school year. So we see pictures, Jimmy holding up a, a sign, first day of preschool, Sarah, kindergarten, day one, Ben, sixth grade, the big middle schooler, Becca, senior year, we can't believe it. Whether preparing to take a child to the first day of daycare just for a couple hours or driving away from a dorm, leaving them in, in, in their first semester of college, parents in this season sit somewhere between excitement and terror, between elation and tears. I will never forget what it was like to drop off our oldest daughter for her first day of elementary school. We, we walked to the kindergarten playground. She, she proudly got in line. She was wearing a backpack that was entirely too big for her small frame. We, we gave her a hug. Then I went back and got a, another hug. And then we joined the lineup of parents watching through the chain link fence as, as our kids walked around the corner and out of sight. It might sound a little funny, but I wonder if Jesus had the same sort of butterflies when he sent out the 12, and then later, as we just read, the 72, as I felt that day. Did he wonder what they were going to do? Did he sit there while they were out thinking, are they making friends? Are they able to track? Are they able to pay attention? How many enemies have they made? Or, or how many times have they had to wipe the dust off their feet? Were they accepted? I imagine he had a good idea of what they would experience. I mean, after all, this was a sort of ministry that, that wasn't new for him, but it was new for them. When they return, and, and Luke writes that the 72 are filled with joy and, and that Jesus was too, I can't help but project the giddiness that I felt when we went back to pick up our daughter at the end of that first day of kindergarten. Now, if she said anything remotely close to what the 72 said, about demons submitting to her and all that. If she, she got even close to that, I probably have been more than just a little concerned. And, and I'm sure my phone would be ringing shortly later with a call from her teacher and principal. But she was excited. She was thrilled. We were excited. We were thrilled. We wanted to hear about all of those adventures from that day. The names of her friends, the games she played on the playground, her favorite part of the day, her least favorite part of the day. Did she learn anything new? We wanted to share in the joy of the new beginning. This new chapter for the 72 or the 70, depending on what translation of Luke you read, it reminds us that being sent out into the world by Jesus is good. It's plentiful. There's a lot of work and it can also be painful all at the same time. Now, the main difference between the sending out of the 12 and the 72 is that we get a glimpse of the return of what it looks like when they got back with the 72. We don't get that with the 12. They are elated, and Jesus delights in their work as they return. He says, I saw it too. I saw it, guys. Satan fell. You trampled snakes and scorpions. What authority? But don't let it get to your head. Don't get cocky. Rejoice for the right reasons. It was a reminder to not get too high, to not take too much credit, to stay humble. I've shared about this before, but one of my first seminary professors, she would start every class with a story and then use the same tagline. Remember, all ministry is God's ministry. By the end of the quarter, we would groan every time we heard those words. But here I am, years and years later, repeating them. It was impactful. It's a reminder that we all need the work that we are involved in here in the church, in, in our, our own faith development, isn't about building our own fiefdom. It's about proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is available everywhere to everyone. And we get to be a part of letting others know about it. But Jesus doesn't spend too long with that reality check with the seventy. The phrase Luke uses in, in verse 21, right before he prays, it, it's totally unique. This is the only place this particular word is used to describe Jesus' emotion. Earlier, I used the word giddy to try to capture what I felt when our daughter returned from her first day of kindergarten. And, and the word used here isn't too far from that sentiment. It carries the sense of, of uh, being overwhelmed or beside oneself with, with joy. It's actually the same word that Luke uses to describe 
what Mary feels after she visits Elizabeth. This is the Magnificat. She, she shares about her pregnancy and she sings out her soul glorified, her soul magnified the Lord, her spirit rejoiced. It was giddy with the news. In the same way, now her son can't contain himself, so he prays. He thanks God for the unveiling of the truth to the 72, the truth about God's kingdom, the truth about Jesus, the truth about being a part of bringing wholeness and restoration and peace in the villages, in the towns, sent out to the whole world. It was a truth that, that wasn't understood by people who had previously been considered wise, who had been searching for generation. And here in this place, as Eugene Peterson translates, these hidden things, they've been hidden from the know-it-alls, but they were shown to the innocent newcomers. Jesus guides them, he challenges them, he sends them out, and he rejoices upon their return. The work is good, it's plentiful, and it can be painful. And then he prays. He thanks God for what God is doing while reminding these newcomers who are likely listening along to the prayer of the unique relationship that he had with his father. It was a momentous occasion, capped off by a private conversation with the disciples. He, he turns to them and he essentially says, do you realize what is happening? Do you realize what's happening here? Jesus was ushering in the sort of thing that the prophets and kings of old, many of the heroes of faith longed to see, longed to bring, hoped to experience, and the disciples got to witness it all. It's a reminder to celebrate when we see God move in our midst to make sure that we take time to not take it for granted. But it's also a bit of a reminder that we, we don't always get to see the trees or the fruit of the seeds that we've been busy planting. When I read about this shared joy, this story of shared joy, what the 72 express, how Jesus responds, I can't help but see a glimpse of how Sunday mornings could look every week. We come to church or we tune in online. We connect, we sing songs of praise, we, we hear God's word proclaimed, and then we are sent out into the world, into the rest of our week. What would it look like for every Sunday, every time we connect to be a joy-filled reunion, like one of the ones we, we just read about this morning, where we celebrate that we got to be a part of what God had done in the previous week. We are sent, you are sent, I am sent, and we return. Giddy about the places we saw God move, the conversations we had, the love we shared, the slivers of progress we made in, in bringing restoration and healing into Westlake Village, into the Conejo Valley and beyond. Friends, may we be a joyful community, celebrating what God is doing as we're sent by the one who sent was sent to us. Amen. I was talking with a friend earlier this week and was reminded that Sunday morning worship services are really just one component of who we are, really one component of what we do as a church. And that there's a lot of different ways that, that people can be plugged into the life of WPC. And I wanna share a few of those opportunities with you. We're continuing to collect hygiene kits. This is wrapping up our, our summer church-wide service project in partnership with the LA County USC Hospital and we're about 15 kits away from our goal. So if you'd like to participate, I invite you to put one together and drop it off in the office. The choir is returning and the first rehearsal is this coming Thursday. So if you're interested, if you maybe have some questions about what that looks like with all that's going on this year, I would encourage you to reach out to Ed Smart. Fall is just around the corner. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, we're, we're preparing for what's coming. And I wanna give you a few dates to just, just write down on your calendar now. 
The first day of our preschool is August 31st, and so I want to invite us all to be in prayer for the families, the kids, uh, the teachers, for Julianne as they kick off a new year. September 12th, we'll be kicking off the new year here on Sunday morning, and so I want to invite you to come and hear about what we have going on throughout the rest of the year. That's September 12th. On October 10th, uh, we'll be having a kind of a goodbye party for Pastor John, so come on that Sunday as well. And then later that month, on October 21st and 22nd, we will be hosting the Grandparenting Summit for grandparents throughout the Conejo Valley with the Legacy Coalition. This is a, a nationally simulcasted event, um, and we'll be sending out more information in the coming days, in the coming weeks and months. It's something I'm really excited about, and if you are a grandparent, I would highly recommend that you save those two dates, October 21st and 22nd. It's a Thursday and a Friday. At some point, we'll also be dedicating our courtyard this fall. Right now, uh, it's under construction, and that construction is just a little bit behind schedule, but it should definitely be done by some point early in the fall. This last week, we kind of crossed a, a milestone. We, we raised just over the $50,000 of the $125,000 mark that we're, we're aiming to raise. And if you'd like to contribute, I'd encourage you to reach out to Heidi or to, Her to Terry in the office. And remember that there's really no amount that's too big or, or, or too small. We're really able to do all that we do here at WPC because of the ties and the offerings of our congregation, our shared gifts with one another. It's one way we partner together to bring glimpses of God's love, of God's kingdom to our neighbors and out to the entire world. Now you can give online through our website. You, you can give through the mail. You can drop something in the mail and it will get to our office or by texting the word WPC Give to 77977. And now as we conclude this morning's service, I'd invite you to join with us in our closing song. So friends, as you are sent out, go out with the love of God the Father, with the grace offered by Jesus Christ, God's only Son, and with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.